there is a majority of people, does that automatically make them a superior group? Does that allow them to make the decisions, allow them to create the rules? When does a person's right go out the window when it is overruled by majority? As Taylor has stated, with the politics of equal dignity, what is established is meant to be universally the same, an identical basket of rights and immunities. Yet, how can that be when a minority can be simply overruled? The right to freedom of speech, for example. We choose our language of choice and expect to be given the right to speak that language, yet in Quebec they have fought since the year of Confederation in 1867 to have their language recognized. Since Confederation, Quebec has been recognized as having separate rights for the religion, laws, and language. But here is where it gets complicated. Everyone wants the same rights, yet they don't want to be treated differently. Canada has become a patchwork quilt in green bays, as Ignatieff would say, since the very beginning. They want to be recognized for their distinctiveness, so how does that work? For those who are recognized for their distinctiveness, often in turn are blamed by the majority for having more privileges or an unfair advantage. The real image of rights and recognition is that this cannot coexist without problems. Quebec and Canada have been in a constant debate about bilingualism for centuries. The debate centers around Quebec's French language being recognized when in turn it is Anglophones and Francophones fearing the loss of their own culture, fearing the loss of their language and having a majority rule over it. While you may be surprised to hear that Anglophones fear the loss of their language and culture, it is a pushback to Quebec's strong presence. Bilingualism is no longer seen as an asset. It is almost a requirement, and many Anglophones have begun to feel suffocated with the French requirements for jobs, politics, and day-to-day -day living. The presence of another culture and language is fearful for societies, but doesn't this story sound familiar? Not too long ago were the requirements for French-speaking citizens, ones like to be able to speak English, send their children to English schools, and learn English for jobs. When will a balance be found in Canada? We pride ourselves on being a bilingual country, but those who live in this country know that bilingualism isn't so easily accepted as we might claim it is. The French versus English debate is still very present in politics today. The unacceptance of other cultures is what holds societies back. Canada is extremely diverse, that is known worldwide, but our acceptance of other cultures can be limited. Although we may claim to be open to other cultures, when it comes down to it, many of us are uneducated on any cultures that differ from our own. We fear the unknown. That is the current debate on multiculturalism, as Taylor points out. As societies are becoming increasingly multicultural, they are becoming more porous. Canada is thought to be supremely guilty for our westernized belief that we are superior to cultures of others. With this assumed superiority, it is where lack of education and ignorance comes into play with the lack of education and knowledge of other cultures, statements like, when the Zulus produce a Tolstoy, we will read him, happens, famously said by Saul Bello. Ignorance and non-acceptance of other cultures had started in Canada with the assimilation of aboriginals. The recognition of aboriginal rights were not present when assimilation began. Aboriginals were seen as uncivilized, almost like savages to the European settlers who were took on the superior roles. In 1763, though, the aboriginals were recognized for their treaty rights as Ignatieff states, hence their identity of separate nations. But they were not seen as equal, and their old treaty rights were dismissed. They were later made wards of state through the Indian Act, but they still gave them no political rights, denying the right to represent themselves on a political level. In all, we destroyed their culture, their societies, even now, Aboriginal people are seen as outcasts in our society, as a debt we must pay back for everything we have done. But what did we think the outcome would be? When you assimilate a culture, that is what happens. You crush the souls of the society. No matter how many political speeches of apologies or healing groups led by politicians that are invite only, by the way, will help the people of the Aboriginal culture. So what is better then? Based on Ignatieff and Taylor, when comparing distinctiveness, should you stay strong to your distinctiveness of your culture until it is destroyed for being different like the aboriginals, or fight for centuries to be recognized and accepted like the Quebec people are dealing with? So the question is, how do you get your rights recognized? Do you fight for them, be destroyed by them, or just stay quiet?